go with that because I think it'll end up being a lot of fun anyway. And um, what I propose to do is to speak for uh, in two half hour segments, speak for a half hour and then take a break uh, and then for another half hour. For the first half hour, what I'd like to talk about is mythology and its relationship to spirituality, religion, and science. And so I want to kind of create a mandala in your imagination that deals with these four subject areas and kind of discuss the ways in which these four areas interface with each other. Now, um, the book itself is dedicated to capturing a whole epoch that has been going on really since the 60s uh, in the Western imagination that has to do with the impact of mythology upon science. Now, that might give us pause and that because normally what we are taught is the reverse, that science has impacted and dissolved myth out of existence. And with respect to myth here, uh, I mean specifically the biblical mythology that uh, supported and informed and built Western civilization for a number of centuries, at least since the third and fourth uh, century AD. That mythology itself, and in that mythology, what we are to imagine is um, this is the sort of uh, vision of the cosmos that was disintegrated by the impacts of these cosmological transformations uh, that were brought about at the hands of our great uh, scientists. Specifically, we have to imagine the cosmos as an epic drama in three massive phases, a genesis of the cosmos, whereupon there is a subsequent fall and nature is regarded as fallen due to the disobedience of the original sin of Adam and Eve. Nature is fallen and the spirit is up here and there is an ontological disjunction between them. Uh, the world of nature mirrors the world of the spirit but it is a more or less simulacrum, a degraded image of the spiritual realm and the two are kept quite separate with the exception of the figure of the Christ who is the sort of linchpin between the heavens and the earth with respect to the fact that he is consubstantial with the Holy Ghost and God on the one hand and true man on the other. He is consubstantial with us. And so he links us through our humanity to his humanity and through his consubstantiality with the divine links us to God. And he is the only being in this creation that is allowed to be thought of as simultaneously spiritual and temporal or human. Then we have a shift into uh, his actual incarnation and crucifixion and resurre resurrection as the sort of middle period of this entire vision, and this will all portend a second judgment, an apocalypse wherein he will return and there will be a massive redemption and a separation of the righteous from the wicked. This is the sort of medieval vision of the cosmos that was disintegrated by first Columbus with his discovery in 1492 of a route that he thought would lead him directly to Japan, but he stumbled instead upon a whole new continent. And uh, after Columbus, we shift into Copernicus in 1543. And Copernicus was really, Copernicus represents, I mean, there's a lot of theories about, there's a lot of misunderstandings about Copernicus with respect to this brilliant revolutionary who defied the church and came up with this idea that uh, the cosmos really revolves around the sun and not the earth. The image that was taught in the universities was in the the Ptolemaic image during the Middle Ages was that the earth is at the center of creation. It's fallen there because of its weight. Earth is the heaviest of all of the elements. And revolving around it are these translucent crystalline spheres, each one of which contains a little planet that it carries along. And these spheres are made of a substance that is unique in all of creation. It is called ether. And earth does not contain ether. Earth is made up of the reciprocity of the four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. But ether uh, is alive, it is unlike these elements, and it turns with perfect circular motion. And so we are to imagine that the cosmos was this kind of perpetual motion machine within which these spheres were carried along by this living uh, ether. Now there was an alternative vision that slightly changed things a bit when the Christians came in. They picked up this image from the Greeks, and they said, well, the ether might be alive, but it's also pushed by angels. So each one of these spheres was assigned a particular angel that pushed the sphere along almost mechanically. And that began to lay the basis in the Western imagination for a kind of mechanistic vision of the cosmos. It was uh, Buridan, who was one of these French scholastics during the 13th or 14th century, who was the first to suggest with the impetus theory that the, these angels would be entirely unnecessary if we imagine that God initially imparted to these spheres an impetus that set them into motion, and because motion in outer space was thought to be undissipated, 
something that there were no there was no friction there would be no nothing out there that would slow down the spheres we have no need of angels we simply set the spheres in motion and this thing goes and he was the first to begin sort of moving the angels off of the spheres and begin thinking in terms of these inorganic mysterious forces turning this whole thing around and so we shifted out of that with the Copernican imagination, and Copernicus was a very devout religious man who was a Renaissance scholar and really wanted to save the Platonic vision of perfect circular motion. Uh, the complexity of the motions of the planets had become so tangled and difficult that the idea of perfect circularity had been lost. And Copernicus was really a conservative man, not a revolutionary at all, and he wanted to restore Plato's idea of this perfect circular vision, so he thought the best way to do that would be to situate all of this around the sun rather than the earth. So with that image now, for the first time in the Western imagination, we begin to get this idea of a visible cosmos that is at odds with our intellectual vision of it. I mean, what we see is what appears to the senses is that the earth is moving around the sun, but here we have an intuition through mathematics that this is not the case at all, but that the entire cosmos is swirling around the sun. And so we begin at that point, the foundations are laid for the series of scientific transformations that take place after Copernicus. We move from Copernicus into Kepler and Galileo and Newton, who really put the capper on all of this. Kepler said he was an astronomer whose mother was uh, hunted down and nearly burned uh, for being a witch and would have been burned if uh, he had not held an important post as an imperial mathematician. And Kepler said, my aim is to show that the celestial machine is to be likened not to a living organism, but rather to a mechanical clock. And the way in which this will happen is, if you imagine that, if you divest your imagination of these angels turning these spheres, or that there is an anima mundi, or a world soul that animates everything, but instead there is a force, and Kepler thought it was magnetism because he didn't know about gravity, that radiates out from the sun and falls off the further the planets get out from the sun, then we have no need to suppose that the universe is alive. It can be explained in terms of these inorganic forces. Well, now from that point on, Kepler's uh, vision of the cosmos really became the sort of central standard vision of the clockwork god. Think about this. The moment that we imagine that the solar system is like a mechanical clock, we have cast God into the role of a clockmaker. And Newton came along and inherited this image near the end of the 17th century. And uh, now it had been thought, recall, that during the Middle Ages that the laws of the heavens were different from those of the Earth. It was a totally other world out there. The heavens were the realm of eternity, the realm of God and his angels, of perfection. The Earth was, the realm, the earth was fallen, and it was the realm of time, of corruption and generation, of sin and death. Well, Newton came along and he said, well... Actually, the same force that makes the apple fall from the tree also makes the moon fall perpetually around the earth and the planets fall perpetually around the sun. They are simply to be regarded as fallen bodies which somehow never managed to hit their targets. But Newton's calculations indicated to him that if the planets were left of themselves, they would eventually crash into the sun. And so Newton had to have recourse to his idea of the clockwork god who periodically had to intervene in his creation to reset the planets so that they would not crash into the sun. Well, now, after Newton, the French atheist in the 18th century, Laplace, came along and uh, laid out these glittering arrays of mathematical equations and did away with God. Uh, the French were really the first atheists, and they may be the last. And uh, Laplace got rid of God, kept the Newtonian vision, and Napoleon asked of him, he said, Laplace, where is there room in your vision for God? And Laplace said, sire, I have no need of that hypothesis. So there was a wonderful new confidence coming in by the end of the 18th century on the part of the Western intelligentsia with respect to these uh, inorganic forces that were capable of translation into mathematics and had no need to have reference to a god at all. And so from that point on, the mechanistic vision held really until it was slowly dismantled first by thermodynamics and electrodynamics, and then the capper was put on it by Einstein and the movement, the uh, developments in relativity theory on the one hand and in the realm of the microcosm with respect to quantum mechanics on the other. 